Hey, I have a question for you. My buddies and I were shooting, we're shooting like a little, like a video. We're asking people a question. Um, I'm just curious what you think about what happens when we die. So, do you believe that we go to heaven when we die? Do you believe that we go to heaven when we die? Does anybody got an opinion on what happens when we die? So, do you believe that we go to heaven when we die? What do you think happens when you die? Wrong question. What makes it rough? So many different views. Yeah. So many different ideas. You never know. But you're, you're sure that we when go to I'm heaven? Dead, when I'm dead, it really don't matter what I believe now. <laughs> Do you believe that we go to heaven when we die? Um, it's unknown. <laughs> it's unknown? And, and I won't rule out anything. I won't rule out a heaven or a hell. I won't rule out reincarnation. I won't rule out anything. I, I, I might keep open mind to everything. So do you believe that, that we go to heaven? I believe we go to earth and I'll place what we wait for God to come back again. I don't think we directly go straight to heaven. I think we go to Abraham. What do you think happens when we die? I think it's just black and there's nothing, honestly. What if you're wrong? What if you're wrong? Scary thought. Yeah, it is a scary thought. But I mean, it's better you're better you're wrong, and there's nothing, and you're wrong, or you're right, and there's hell. We're in the second week of our Rapture series. Come on, anybody enjoy that last week? If you weren't here last week, just kind of a brief recap. Uh, we laid the foundation uh, with the rapture, and we talked about how we need to live like it's our last, right? Um, picking apart the word rapture and what that looks like and how we should live every day ready for the rapture. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Next week, <clears throat> don't miss next week, we're going we're gonna to hit some, we're going to pick apart some heavy hitters and talk about the seven years of tribulation um, the Antichrist, the false prophet, the mark of the beast, the battle of Armageddon. Um, so you don't want to miss that next week. But today, today we're going to talk about receiving, receiving what's been earned. Receiving what's been earned. So let's turn to Revelation chapter 22. And if you're new to that, it's in the very back of your Bible. All right, if you don't have a Bible, make sure you see somebody today. We'll make sure you get one. But it's the last book in the Bible. We're going to read Revelation chapter 22. And this whole book is written um, by a man named John that the Lord took to an island and, and revealed to him a lot of things about um, the end times. And so that's what you're hearing in Revelation. And um, if you're new to the Christian faith, I don't advise you to dive right into Revelation. Um, start with some other things. And so uh, let's look at, this is actually what Jesus told him in Revelation chapter 22. Revelation 22, just two verses, says in verse 12 and 13, he says, Look, I'm coming soon, and my reward is with me. Somebody say reward. And I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And then he said, I am the beginning and I am the end. Come on, if you're a note taker, write this down. The title of the message today is Judgment Day. Judgment Day. Come on, look at somebody and tell them, you better be ready for the Judgment Day. You better be ready for the Judgment Day. Let's take a minute and pray um, for our lives and, and for the Word. And let's also take a minute and lift up another local body of Christ. Father, we thank you so much for this day. Lord, this is the day that you have made, and we rejoice, and we're glad about it, Lord. Thank you that we, we don't have to start our week off in your house, but, Lord, we get to start our week off in your house, and we lay the foundation for a great week and a great life because we're here in your presence, in your presence. God, thank you for the most amazing people who are with us, Lord, right here in this auditorium and so many with us online, and, God, we're thankful. Thankful for your presence. Thank you for your word. Lord, we take a moment as a church and we lift up another local body of Christ. And Lord, we, I pray, Lord, especially today for, for Manly Baptist Church. And God, I thank you for Pastor Tony Buchanan and his family. And God, for the conversation that we had this week. Lord, I lift him up to you. And I pray that you'd bring healing to his life. Bring healing to his life in the name of Jesus. Lord, you are the God of miracles. 
You can do all things. Touch his life. Lord, I pray that you touch Manly Baptist Church. And Lord, will you, will you help them to grow spiritually and numerically and financially, God? Will you bless them today? Let souls be saved in, in that place. Let lives be healed and people set free. And Lord, will you strengthen their staff? And God, encourage that body of Christ today to continue to be a light in this region. Thank you for them today, God. Thank you for this place and what you're doing right here. And we take the limits off to what you can do in our lives. God, we commit the rest of the service to you. And God, we open up your word. Help us to apply it in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody say a big amen. 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 You may be seated. You may be seated. Let's talk about judgment, judgment day, judgment day. If you make it to heaven, it will not be because you were a good person. The only way that you're making it to heaven is by putting your faith in Jesus Christ and receiving forgiveness from your sins through the grace of God. Now, can I let you know something? Every devil in hell knows that Jesus is real. So just knowing that fact is not what gets you into heaven. It's all about who you know. It's a relationship with him. Can I get an amen from somebody in the house? Now, for those of you who are saved and you are a Christian and you have a relationship with God through Jesus, let me, let me let you know something. How you live on earth will determine how you are rewarded in heaven. How you live on earth will determine how you are rewarded in heaven. There was a pastor and a, and a teenage Uber driver. Somebody say, God help us. A teenage Uber driver. Um, they, made, they both made it to heaven. They both made it to heaven. St. Peter was there and... He's like, man, so glad that you're here. Welcome, welcome to heaven. And he says, Pastor, I, we, we got a, a, a special place just for you. Got a, got a, a, you know, a ranch-style house with you know, a three bedrooms and two baths. And it's on a nice piece of land. You're, you're really going to like it. And Pastor says, you know, thank you. And then he takes the teenage Uber driver over and says, we, we, we hooked you up. We've got you a mansion on the beach Seven bedrooms, four bath, entertainment center in, in there, a movie theater in the basement. You're going to love it. Overlooks the ocean. You're gonna, it's beautiful. You're going to love it. And, and, and the pastor says, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm a pastor. Like, you gave him such a better hookup than you did me. And St. Peter said, well, listen, here's the deal. When, when you preached, people slept. But when this teenage Uber driver drove, people prayed. Welcome to heaven. That pastor was not the avenue pastor because you sleeping in here, you're on drugs or something. For real. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, how you live matters. How you live, how you live matters. Judgment day. Let's, let's look at it. What, what is going to happen on judgment day? And which judgment day will you be a part of? Some of you are thinking, what, what, what? Which judgment day will you be a part of? So I want us to look at the two different judgment days during the end times. The first one being, let's look today at the judgment seat of Christ. And let's also look at the great white throne judgment. The judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment. Let's, let's puzzle this together and see when all of this will play out. Y'all with me? So let me, let me give you a timeline. Uh, just warning right up front. This is, not, this is not the gospel according to Justin Graham. This is our best analysis from all the information from Scripture. Is there a chance that I'm off on the exact timing of all this? Sure. But am I off on the events that are going to take place? Absolutely not. Because all of this is Scripture and all of these things will happen. So let's, let's kind of just lay this out here of a timeline. The, the first thing that's going to happen, we talked about all of this last week. Christ's going to return, right? Christ will return. This is the breakdown of the rapture. The dead in Christ will rise, and then the Christians are raptured up out of here. Can I get an amen from anybody in the house? And after this, you'll have the judgment seat of Christ. Now, if you're a note taker and you're trying to write all this down real quick, pull your cell phone out, snap a picture of it. So we can move on, or you can follow it in you version, because there's no way you're going to look all these scriptures up right now. All right, so after the judgment seat of Christ, we're going to enter into what's called the seven-year tribulation. The seven-year tribulation is where the Antichrist will rise, the false prophet will rise, the mark of the beast. Um, It's a very scary time that you will experience if you miss the rapture. And let me tell you something, you do not want to experience what's going to happen there. Then you're going to, they're going to witness the, the battle of Armageddon take place. Um, you're, you're going to see Satan thrown into the bottomless pit next. And then Christ's return 
for a thousand year millennial reign and then at the conclusion of that Satan is going to be unleashed for a short time only only to 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 be thrown into the 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 lake of fire and all of this to establish what the 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 new heaven and the new earth the new heaven and a new earth so let's look at the two judgment days first you've got the judgment seat of Christ now, a lot, of, a lot of scholars believe that this will take place right after the rapture. And here's one of the reasons why. Luke chapter 14, 12 through 14, Jesus said, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back and repay you so that you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor. Invite the crippled. Invite the lame and the blind. And you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Come on. May the Avenue Church always be a place to help those who can never pay us back. So the judgment seat of Christ will take place right after the rapture. 2 Corinthians 5, 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Understand this. This is a judgment for Christians. This is not, about, this is not a judgment about salvation. This is not determining if you'll make it to heaven or not. He's not going to bring you up there and go, I brought you here. See you later. This is not determining if you'll make it to heaven or not. This is a judgment rewarding you for good works. Write this down in your notes. This is the one you want to be a part of. So let's break it down. The judgment seat. In the Greek, it's the word bema. Not to be confused with Bama who got beat yesterday. Praise God, won't he do it? Won't he do it? Won't he do it? I just had to, I had to slip that in there. And I had to slip it in. The judgment seat is the Greek word Bama. It's, it's, now watch. It's defined as a step, a rostrum, or a throne. Now, another definition of it said a foot breath. I didn't want to put that one up there because he thought, what, what in the world's a foot breath? And that'd be kind of weird to, in fact, just look at your neighbor and say, you've got foot breath. And so it's, it's not, I didn't want to put that one up there. So let me, let me explain this. This is, not, this is not a judgment of salvation or damnation. This is not a seat like a judge punishing criminals. This was a throne to distribute awards like at the Olympics. Or the Grecian games. This was for those winning the race so they would step up on a Bema to receive an award on how they finished. Come on, y'all with me, church? The word is seat or Bema. The word judgment was added in the English to help illustrate its meaning, but it's very easily misinterpreted. The Bema judgment has nothing to do with the great white throne judgment that we'll talk about in a minute. This is not the time when Jesus is judging between right and wrong or heaven and hell. This is a celebration and a time where the Savior of the world is going to allow those of us who make it to have the opportunity to stand up on a bema, that victory step, and allow Jesus Christ to crown us and reward us for what we have done on this earth. High five your neighbor. Tell him you don't want to miss that. You don't want to miss that. So let me, let me explain it further this way. My son Judah, he runs cross country, and he wants so bad to, to be in the top few of the runners because when you're in the top few best runners, you get an award. Like we, don't, we don't run races and play sports and compete to lose. You run to win. You compete to win. So, so I tell my son, which he's gotten so much better this, this, this past year, and I tell my son, listen, if you want to be able to step up there and receive an award at the end of the race, it's not what you do in the race that's really going to determine it. It's what you're going to do behind closed doors that nobody sees. 
It's the amount of water that you're drinking. It's the stretching that you're doing. It's the things that you're eating. It's how much rest that you're getting. It's things that you do behind closed doors that nobody knows anything about that when you step up in the race, you'll be able to perform like you need to be able to perform. I I hope y'all are getting this today. Don't, Don't miss this, church. There are no participation awards in heaven. Ask my kids. Oh, I better, I'll I'll lose some followers right here. My kids got all excited one day at field day. They brought over a white ribbon. I'm like, what is is this? I'm like, I saw you got beat a lot. I don't, I don't sugarcoat nothing. I'm not going to sit here and go, you did so awesome. No, that was terrible, bro. That was awful. What? I, th- I thought she'd be excited. I'm like, you got to participate. He came in last place. <laughs> Participation award. Like, what do you want me to do? That? I'm so proud you came in last. <laughs> that's the best. Gen Zers, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. <laughs> but this world is handing out participation awards to everybody. You woke up today. Are you good? How can I award you? Can, can we cancel something? Can I just go ahead and cancel something? I, I love that we all have different types of jobs. But if I get asked to tip anymore, I'm about to lose my mind over people asking, Do you want a tip? For what? Why am, I, why am I tipping you? I'm already paying you 15 bucks for a hamburger. I tip at restaurants. Good, too. Good, real good. But when I walk into some place that's not even selling me food, <laughs> doing nothing for me, you want to leave a tip? Oh, you haven't even done anything for me. Like, what am I? Well, I woke up today. I showed up at work. Most people don't even do that. You should be proud of me. Participation award. Well, I'm saying stuff y'all would never say. I'm saying it. There's no participation awards in heaven. I'll tell you what is going to be there, though. There's going to be some awards. Can I talk about the five awards that, that we for sure know about? There could be more, but... Here are the five crowns, the five. Look, some of y'all are still bothered about the whole. You'll be all right. If I go to a restaurant today, I tip 20%. I, at least. I take care of people. But sweet mercy. I'm getting asked to tip for going buying like duct tape, but it's still like, why am I tipping you? <laughs> some of y'all are offended. You'll be all right. But here, here are the five crowns mentioned in Scripture that we know will be handed out. Now, I'm warning you, I was, I've been messed up this week looking at this stuff. I hope, I, hope this, I hope this wrecks you today like it wrecked me. So let's talk about the five crowns that are going to be handed out at Judgment Day. You ready? First is the crown of righteousness. 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. This crown is about godly character. And moral standards. And and, and about someone's character when no one was looking. This is a crown of integrity. It's about how well you finish the race. Jesus will crown those who finish well. Come on, then, then then there's the crown of endurance. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 24 through 27, this crown is about how faithful you were during the race called life. It's a marathon crown. It's it's about how well you fought in the middle even when you wanted to quit. 
This crown is for the disciplined who fought the fight when it would have been easier to quit and give up in the middle of the battle. This is a crown for those who endured the storm. Am I talking to anybody in the house? You walked through the valley. When you got knocked down, baby, you got back up. The crown of endurance will be given to you. Then there's the crown of rejoicing. You got the crown of rejoicing. According to 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 through 20, listen, this is not a crown about what you think. This, is, this crown is not what you think. This is a crown for soul winners. Ah. This is for the ones who witnessed the people and led them to Jesus. The, the reason why it's called the crown of rejoicing is because these people only get the greatest joy when they bring people into the kingdom of God. This is a crown for people who plundered hell just to populate heaven. It's for the young lady last week who invited a friend to church. And not only did her friend come to church, but her two parents came with her. And not only did they come to church, but all of them got saved last week week. That young lady will get a crown of rejoicing. Oh, my prayer is that on judgment day, every person who's a part of the avenue will be standing there together because together we had a passion for lost people and we did whatever it took to win people to Jesus. We didn't give in to the religious naysayers. We loved people and took them to Jesus. Oh, come on. Anybody thankful to be a part of a church? that will receive a crown of rejoicing because we're leading people to Jesus. Woo! Jesus will crown those who rescue the lost. Then there's the crown of glory. This one's personal. So if I get up on a soapbox for a second, I'm going to. Because the crown of glory, according to 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4, this is the pastor's crown. This, one, this one's personal to me. This is for the ones who were in charge of the flock. For the pastors and elders who gave of themselves and denied themselves. This is a crown for every sleepless night. This is a crown to honor the time that you had to share your family. This is a crown for pastors who were faithful in their calling to bring the word of God to people even when it wasn't popular, who, who endured the ridicule and who endured all the, the complaining and who endured all the rude jabs and remarks. A crown for pastors who were faithful even when people walked out and walked away. For pastors who prayed through the night for the people in their church. For pastors who endured the pressure even when it would have been easy easier to do something else with their life for pastors who were obedient to the call of God on their life and didn't care if people knew them but they just wanted people to know Jesus <laughs> Pastor Tim I thought about you all week Pastor Tim will you stand up if you don't know this man you need to get to know this man He's an elder of our church. How many back surgeries have you had? 14 back surgeries. And 14 back surgeries have not taken the call of God out of his life. But because of physical demands, he had to step away from full-time ministry. And retire early when the burning passion, passion and desire for pastoring is still inside of his heart. I, I don't believe that God causes those problems. But if he's sovereign, he had to allow them. And it is no accident that God has allowed what you're experiencing. Because he, need, he needed to remove you from where you are to get you here. To help pastor this church. And help be a part of the leadership of this church. This church wouldn't be the same without Pastor Tim Teague. And so this crown... It's a crown of glory for men like Pastor Tim Teague who paid the price and is still paying the price to help lead people to Jesus. Come on, will you help me honor the man of God in the house today that will wear a crown of glory one day? God's not done with you, Pastor Tim. Your best days are still ahead of you. The greatest anointing is still upon your life.
Jesus will crown the pastors who were faithful. And then there's, then there's the crown of life. According to Revelation chapter 2, 8 through 11, this, whew, this one's heavy. This is a crown for those who suffered martyrdom and persecution for their faith in Jesus. I'm going to be real honest with you. We don't know anything about that life. We, we, we think we have it bad when they run out of pumpkin latte in September. It just said my day. <laughs> we complain over the stupidest of stuff. But this crown is for those who were persecuted. Those who were decapitated for their faith. Those, those who were boiled alive for their faith. Those who hide out in underground churches in China just to hear about Jesus. Pe people hide out for days and weeks just to hear the gospel. And we complain if we have to wait in a line of traffic to get in the parking lot. That this is a crown for those same people in China who get busted for meeting in secret places and who have their faith in Jesus and the government lines them up to crush them to death with the steamrollers as other people watch. This is a crown for those who have been tortured by fire for their faith in Jesus. And on judgment day, at the judgment seat of Christ, Jesus will crown those who were persecuted. Come on, I need you to touch your neighbor and tell them, I want, I want one of those crowns. I, I, want, I want one of those crowns. All of this explanation about crowns and awards to tell you this. Imagine Avenue. Imagine church. Jesus stepping up on that Bama seat and rewarding you that day. This is not a gavel of judgment coming down on you. This is an award ceremony where God himself will say, remember when you went through that battle. And remember when you showed up for that person and no one else may have noticed you. And God will say, I saw you. I, I saw you. No one else may have seen it, but I saw you. A lot of people made all kinds of false accusations against you. But I saw you when you never retaliated. I heard your prayers when you asked God, when you asked me to bless that person, even though they were doing you wrong. I saw you as you walked through cancer and you never stopped believing. All those times that hell through everything it could against Against your life and against your marriage and against your health and against your mind and against your finances. I saw you and you kept fighting back. You kept getting back up. You never quit. You felt all alone. You thought no one cared. And at the judgment seat of Christ, everything you went through on this earth will all be worth it as King Jesus crowns you and celebrates your life. I may be talking to the wrong people, but I've come to tell every person at the avenue new church. I do not live my life to be validated by people. I live to honor God so I can stand on that victory podium and receive an award from Jesus to have the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords look at me and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Oh, come on. I wish I could find some safe folk up in here who's excited about Judgment Day when you get to celebrate with King Jesus. Come on. Somebody give God a big shout of praise in the house. Woo. Come on. I need you to get up and find three people and tell them, do something to get a crown. Do something. Do something to get a crown. Do something to get a crown. Come on online. Talk to me. I need to do something to get a crown. Yeah, but I'll just, I'll just settle for a participation award. Amen. Are you kidding me? To know that you could have a moment when you could step up on a Bama and allow Jesus. I don't think you get it. To have the king look you in the eye as you lean over 
him grab that crown. Place it on your head. And say, well done. My good and faithful servant. Woo! I wish you could feel what I feel right now. I know we don't walk by feeling, but man, I feel the Holy Ghost in this house today. Heaven's going to be so good, but it's going to be humbling. Now check this avenue. That's all just the beginning. That's like, that's like day one. FYI, there's no more like time. There's not like, man, we've been celebrating people for the past 45 minutes. How long are we going to do this today? you imagine like time not even be an issue for you like back pain not an issue for you and like you ain't got a care in the world and like here hey Joey come on up but we're gonna we're gonna crown you and people are like let's go Joey <laughs> and then Jason it's your turn come on oh Jason we're gonna crown you today buddy Let's put crowns aside for just a second. We'll come back. So just, just real quick, so we, we, we get awards, but what, three, three things real quick, what, what heaven's going to be like. Number one, heaven will be immeasurably better than just good. He, heaven, heaven's going to be good. No, no, no. Better. Better than good. Revelation 21.1, then I saw a new heaven, a new earth. For the first heaven, the first earth had passed away. Heaven will be immeasurably better than just good. Your best moment, your, I want you to picture, your favorite moment on this earth doesn't even compare to how good heaven's going to be. We cannot even comprehend how good it will be. Imagine it. Sin conquered. Death defeated. Things will be restored back to its pure form. Things you enjoy now, you can enjoy then. But without the frustration of sin messing everything up, 1 Corinthians 2, 9, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Nothing on this earth or in this universe that compares to how amazing heaven will be. Come on. If you're thankful for that, somebody shout a big amen. Amen. Come on, high five your neighbor. Tell me it'll be better than good. It'll be better than good. Better than good. Better than good. It'll be immeasurably, immeasurably better than just good. Here's the second thing how heaven's going to be. Number two, heaven will be the end of all pain and sorrow. Hallelujah. Revelation 21, same chapter we're in, verses 4 and 5 says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order things have passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And if that doesn't get you fired up, your woods way. Or sorry, if that don't get you pumped up, there's something wrong with you. I, I don't know about you, but I, I've had to deal with death with my family and friends. And I'm tired of that. I've, I've had to battle some difficult seasons in my life, and I've mourned over some lost battles, and I've shed my share of tears over frustration and anxiety and, and setbacks and failures. I've walked through some painful seasons of my life that most people know nothing about, and I cannot wait for all things to be made new. Amen. Come on, Avenue, wrap your mind around it. No more death. No more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. Come on, I've come with some good news today. You definitely want to make it to heaven. You do not want to miss it. Newsflash to every person who's been hurting, to every person who has hurt. When life dealt you a low blow, when people turn their back on you, when this world lets you down, to every person who's been mistreated, to every person who's been done wrong, for every time you had to say goodbye to a loved one who passed away, heaven will be the end of all pain and sorrow. There will be no more fear and no more worry and no more stress, no more hunger, no more sickness, no more cancer, no more heartache, no more loneliness, no more betrayal, no more sleepless nights, no more abuse, no more divorce, no more wars, no more racism. Come on, that's a good place, Avenue. We're about a 10-second praise break because you're thankful that heaven will be the end of all pain and all sorrow. Come on, Avenue. Give God a big praise in the house. Woo! 
Heaven will be immeasurably better than just good. Heaven will be the end of all pain and sorrow. Here's the third one. Heaven will allow you to be with God forever. Heaven will allow you to be with God forever. Revelation chapter 21, verse 3. He says, and I heard a loud voice from the throne. Now, that, that's important right there because check this out. That's the, that's the 20th time that that's said in Revelation. And I heard a loud voice from the throne. It's also the last time. And many scholars will tell you that when you hear something for the last time, pay attention to what it says because it's very important. And I heard from a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. Woo. And he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Do you understand how incredibly awesome that is right there? Up, up to this point in our human form, no one could look at God and live. Our physical bodies could not handle it. In fact, Moses said, Lord, can you show me your glory? And if you know the story in Exodus, you know that, that God replied to Moses saying, I can't let you do that. You couldn't handle it. You would physically die. But in heaven... God's dwelling place will be with us, and God himself will live with us. In other words, heaven is going to be so amazing because then God will finally be fully satisfied. Why? Because he will finally be able to be with us, and we'll be with him. And just in case you have forgotten, or just in case you've never heard, God wants you in heaven. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everything everlasting life. Come on. That's heaven avenue, and you do not want to miss it. Come on, look at somebody and tell them, whatever you do, don't miss it. Whatever you do, don't miss it. Whatever you do, don't miss it. But there's a problem. Well, this, is, this is good, Pastor. This is, heaven's going to be great. You offended me about the tipping, but heaven's going to be great. I tip real well, real well. Heaven, this is great, Pastor. Heaven's going to be, I can't wait. I'm going to make it. We got a problem. Heaven's not an automatic. And a lot of people think it is. Heaven, heaven is not just for good people. The problem is, Heaven is not the default. I can't tell you how many times people have said, well, they're a good person. They're in a better, better place now. In fact, the first funeral I ever preached, my father-in-law had something major come up, and he couldn't be at this funeral. And it was a funeral for people who didn't even go to our church, never even knew them. And they just needed, they, they requested, needed somebody to... People die to think, well, I gotta have a pastor there. Yeah. They called the church and my father in law agreed to do it and he couldn't be there and he said, Hey, I, I need you to step in and do this. I'm like, well, Who are these people? He's like, I don't know. And I'm like, What are you doing to me? I've never even preached a funeral before and you're. It's my crown of glory I was working on. <laughs> and, I, and I had some stuff prepared, you know. And I'm thinking, Man. And I pull up. And I'm telling you, it was heavy, y'all, because real quick I realized, man, I, I am not in Kansas. <laughs> like people were, were publicly drinking alcohol at the funeral. It was something like I had never seen before. The, the, the per, they, had, they had this person cremated, which to each their own, whatever, that's not the point. Had him cremated, had his ashes up on this table with cases of Budweiser everywhere around it. Cigarettes, tobacco, all of it up there. Pictures of them partying it up everywhere and anywhere you can imagine. I'm like, what is going on right now? And I recognized real quick, this person was not saved. Let me help you understand something. There's no preacher good enough, close to God enough, that can preach you into heaven.
And I can't tell you how many times that night I heard, well, so-and-so is a good person. They're in a better place now. And my heart grieved because I knew good and well that wasn't true. Most people believe that heaven's a default. It's not. Actually, hell's a default. Matthew chapter 7, 13 through 14, Jesus said, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are a few who find it. Up to this point today, it hasn't been that bad of a judgment, right? I mean, we... Because the judgment seat of Christ is for the Christian. It's for those who have a relationship with God. But there's a day coming for the rest. For those who did not have a relationship with God. For those who rejected that moment on earth. They'll have to experience the second judgment. The great white throne judgment. Revelation 20. 11 through 15 describes this judgment like this. I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it. And death and Hades, or hell, death and hell gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Pay attention. You think, you think people who don't make it to heaven are going to spend eternity in hell forever? No, no, no. It's a different place they're going to spend eternity. Because in this moment, death and hell were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. And anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire where they will suffer in eternity. No, no words, no imagery, nothing could put it into proper context of what that will be like. But, but here's just a, just a clip of, of maybe just a little bit of what that... Check this out. you look at this and it's very easy to think well pastor that just doesn't seem fair it's actually really fair I'll tell you what's not fair it's not fair when someone commits a crime and our judicial system does not punish them for it that's not fair but when someone is punished for their wrong it's called justice And if you take time to really examine it, God is being extremely fair. Well, how do you say that, Pastor? Sin has to be punished. So God sends his son, Jesus, to die for our sins. Again, I'll tell you what's not fair. I've done so many things wrong in my life. And you've done so many things wrong in your life. And our wrong deserves punishment. And when someone doesn't receive the punishment that they do deserve, it's called mercy. Mm. And Jesus didn't do anything wrong. And yet he took the wrath for us. That's not fair. He died on a cross. That's not fair. And it's not fair that Jesus would die in our place. And he did it all so that we wouldn't have to experience the great white throne judgment. He did it all so that we wouldn't have to experience an eternity of fire. Instead, I get to experience the first judgment. I get to experience the Bema seat. I get to experience the reward day. That doesn't seem fair. Newsflash Avenue. We'll be so thankful for mercy and grace on Judgment Day that our natural response will be to worship. Can I, can I go back to the crowds? Can I, can I go back to the crowds real quick? <laughs> for those of us who make it to heaven, 
and you receive a crown, this won't be like a crown or a trophy like we received today and we put it on a wall and we put it in a case and we walk around and, and brag about it. No, no. We'll join the 24 elders in Revelation 4. When Jesus crowns us, we'll be so thankful for grace and mercy that he gave us that we'll have the honor of taking our crowns and laying them back down before the King of Kings who alone is worthy of all glory and all honor. Come on. I wish I could find some people in the house who could just imagine the day when Jesus crowns you. You, you, you may feel like you're more deserving than I am, but I don't feel worthy to be crowned by the King of Kings. Can you imagine what a humbling moment that will be? <laughs> when he looks at you and he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. But I'm a crier, y'all. I'll be a blubbering mess. I'll have the ugly cry going on. <laughs> I ain't fronting at all. I'll have snot flying everywhere. be able to kneel before the one the one who paid it all the one who died on a cross the one who shed his blood the one that they crowned with thorns the one that willingly gave up his life when I didn't deserve it, time and time and time again, I've had to crawl back to God and say, Lord, forgive me. Have mercy on my soul. Please extend your grace. And you're telling me that King Jesus is going to step up to me and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. I will not walk around in arrogance and say, look at the crown I've received, but I'll be so glad to throw it back down at his feet and say, Jesus, thank you for saving my life. Come on, are there any people that you've walked through hell and high water and God's been faithful through it all that you can't wait for the day that you can be crowned so you can gladly kneel back down and lay it before me and say, God, thank yeah. you that you never took your eye off of me. Thank you, God, that you didn't forget about me. Thank you, God, that you brought me through the valley and you brought me through the storm and I'm only here today because you saved my life. Come on, are there any worshipers in the house today that you don't want to wait till heaven, but you want to start your worship now. Come on. Are there any worshipers at the avenue today? Come on. Can we lift our voice and sing your worthy? church imagine imagine the day when Jesus with his nail scarred hands steps allows you to step up on that baby seat maybe I don't know I don't know but just the way I interpret scripture maybe for the first time you're getting to see him on a personal level and him look you in the eye and hear him say well done you're, you're not going to see me in that moment turn around to any of you all who make it there and go look what I got look what I got no, I'm going to say, no, Lord. No, Lord. It's only because of you. 
a song for Cassie Hughes. I know what I've done wrong. I don't deserve it. I've got good news for you, though. Thank goodness heaven is not about what we deserve. So, so the question, I know I can't look at each one of you at one time, but look, look at me. Front, front to back, side to side. I just got one question for you before you leave. What judgment do you want to experience? Which one? What, which one do you want to experience? You, you want to experience reward day or do you want to experience a lake of fire? It's really that simple. So before you leave, with every head bowed, every eye closed, I'm asking you not to leave, not to move, not to look around, just you and the Lord, our prayer team's in position. If you're standing